and I've done a lot of like money mindset work in the past few years is that, you know, it doesn't have to be hard to be rewarding. Right. And I definitely grew up thinking that like, you have to struggle a bit. You have to hustle really, really hard. It has to be difficult in order to achieve X. Right. And that's been a big shift for me is that it doesn't have to be hard. This gets to be easy. You can work smarter, not harder. And that's a big thing that I'm trying to teach my children is that, you know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it unless it brings you joy, happiness, efficiency, more money, whatever that is. If it raises your vibrations, cool, go for it all day long. But if you don't want to go mow the damn lawn, hire the college kid or high school kid across the street for 25 bucks, right? Like you don't have to do the thing just because you can. Welcome to the Communication Queens podcast for the visionary leaders, speakers, service providers, and podcasters who are looking to stand out sharing their story. I'm your host, Kimberly Spencer, former screenwriter turned master communications coach. On this podcast, I'll be coaching you on how to share your own transformation story so that you increase your visibility, influence, and income on podcast interviews. Let's get your voice heard. Jenny, welcome to the Communication Queens podcast. I am so excited to have you here. Oh, thank you so much. I'm really excited about this as well. So let's dive in because you're a seven-figure coach. You have gone from having a photography business with two little kids and then growing into a seven-figure business. And now you have the Seven Figure Coach podcast. And I'm curious, is at what stage in your business did you actually start your own podcast? Not until uh, December of this past year. So it's only been up for less than a year. And I had been asked many times, why don't you have a podcast? And I was like, I talk enough as it is. Like, no one wants to hear me on a podcast. What would I even say? And then finally, I was like, all right, fine. I will do free episodes. And if it flops, then we know it flops and that's okay. And so it's been super, super fun. And it's been really well received. We've had over 10,000 downloads now. And it's just been really, really fun to do. Yes. And with podcasting, because it's a lot of work, like who, what does your team look like for the podcast? How do you support yourself so that you get to stand out in your zone of genius, talking your talk, but not necessarily doing all the other things? Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's probably why I dragged my feet on this for so long, because I was like, I don't know anything about podcasting. Full disclosure, I'm also not a podcast listener. I know. <laughs> so it's it was one of those things where I was like, I don't know. This doesn't even feel like, do I feel like a fake? Maybe a little. I don't know. But I, I knew that I wouldn't do it if I had to do everything myself because I would have to go learn how to edit and do the jingle and the intro and the outro and all the things, right? And I had no idea how to do that. So I hired a podcast manager who um, I believe works in your group as well. And she's in your world and she has been incredible. Her name is Kim and she just comes in and she asked me, what do you want to do? What do you not want to do? And I was like, I don't want to do anything. She's like, well, you have to actually do something. <laughs> and so now all I do is Fridays, uh, Friday mornings are my podcast days and I just block it off and I go in my little room and I podcast my little heart out and then I just upload it to a Google Drive and she takes care of everything else. <laughs> amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. I love the system. I love just, I mean, because the number one thing I see with podcasters um, typically who are not running seven figure empires is they are doing everything themselves. Yeah. They are doing all the editing and spending 10 hours trying to clip out every um and ah and pop. And I'm like, no, save yeah. yourself. Yeah, yeah, totally. I agree. And I just knew myself. I knew I wouldn't actually sit down and do the thing if I had to do everything myself. And that, that's one big thing I've learned in business. I can't scale by myself. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a huge piece. When starting your podcast because you knew it would take you know be a labor of love what were you doing before to market and obviously it was effective because you scaled seven figures but what, what was your marketing strategy before and how does podcasting really fit into that world really good question um so i ads are my wheelhouse instagram ads facebook ads meta it's my two happy places are when I'm creating ads and I'm a total nerd with numbers. So spreadsheets, Excel, Google Sheets, the whole thing. So I had a fairly frustrating experience a few years ago and I had hired a couple of different ads agencies. Um, I've worked with really big coaches and I knew that that's how they had skilled. And so I dove all in and I was like, okay, take my money. And so, you know, I tried one ads agency. I spent around $10,000. I spent, you know, another time with another. And overall, I spent just over 30,000 with very little ROI. And I said, okay, that's enough. 
I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to get scrappy and I'm going to learn this on my own. And that's if I can't learn it on my own, then I won't do it. I'll find a different way of marketing. And so I cracked the code and have scaled my business to over a million a year with low cost Instagram and Facebook ads. And that's a big piece of what I teach my students. So primarily I was marketing my um, my masterminds, my high ticket programs, my low ticket online courses through ads and having all the funnels set up where, you know, they, they go through a freebie or a nurture sequence or straight to checkout, depending on what the offer is. And then with podcasts, it's been really fun because like I said, I was pretty resistant and I was also like, okay, if anyone even listens, is this really going to be a traffic driver? Like, is anyone, I don't know. I just, I didn't see it. I just didn't see it. And um, I'm so glad that I was pushed by my friends and family to do it. And they're like, just try it. You know, you don't want to die wondering like, what if? And so I tried it. And now it's amazing. We get, you know, people signing up on the email list all the time from the podcast or people popping into the DMs being like, I loved episode whatever where you said this. I'm like, I don't even remember what I said. Is that that bad? <laughs> I was like, was it good? <laughs> it's been a really fun marketing tool. Yeah. Like I, I had the same thing because I've had a podcast since 2019 for my coaching business. And I will get people sliding into the DMs and I'm like, that's awesome. I, I, they're like, can you restate that thing on my podcast? I'm like, I don't know what I said. <laughs> Someone quoted me the other day and I was like, did I really say that? That's actually really good. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so when I, we just get into that flow and into that space of creativity. How do you prep for your podcast? Do you do you have any sort of like routine, or you just like dive in, go in there? And it's really funny. Uh, I had I have a client who's one of my top clients. She happened to be visiting Colorado, and we live in Colorado, so I had her and her husband and her kids over for dinner to meet my family. And she was like, "Where's your podcast studio?" And I was like, "Oh." I'm here. And I like to just keep it real. <laughs> so I show, walk her into the basement, my kid's rec room. I open the closet door. She's like, where the heck are we going? <laughs> it's this gross little closet under the staircase. And I have like old, uh, like an old foam mattress topper in there and a stand for my computer. There's no light. It's pitch black. And she's like, this is where you record your podcast. And I was like, mm -hmm. it's the quietest room in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just keeping it real over here. But yeah, it's um it's been really fun. I to be totally honest, if you know me well, you know that I am a manifesting generator and I fly by the seat of my pants. And I will say that is a big piece of how I've scaled and bringing on and team members that are really good at things that I'm not and really good at like helping me narrow down on what I need to do, where my zone of genius is so I can stay in there. And what we realized is my secret sauce is kind of just riffing, just getting into that creative flow and just going with it. And because I'm from Jersey and I talk so fast, they're like, maybe don't make a script for your first few podcasts. Maybe just get in there and like, you, you know, the overarching theme of what you're going to talk about, but just go with it. And that's what I do every time now. So I have a ongoing, you know, Google sheet where I just pop in ideas when I have them. Or if someone slides into the DMs and says, hey, can you create a podcast episode on this? Or what are your thoughts on this? I'm like, ooh, that'd be a good one. So I literally just write down the topic or the idea and I go into my gross little podcasting closet and I go for it. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I'm the same way. And I've found that that flow space is just like, even as a projector, like just being able to pull from just the, the thoughts and ideas of, of my clients or like topics that I've been working with them through, like it just, it just flows so much better when you're not trying to be when everything is not trying to be poised and perfect and polished. Exactly. Yeah. Beauty. I agree. It's supposed to be an intimate conversation. It's supposed to be like, oh, we're just two boss babes having some coffee and you get to be an amazing fly on the wall for this conversation. Exactly. I think of my business like that now. And I think that was a major shift for me is that I, I'm older. And so I'm 44 and I know I'm friends with a lot of big coaches in the industry. And I remember I'm, I'm good friends with Jenna Kutcher. And I remember saying at one point, I was like, I wish I had started when I was your age, right? Like I wish that I had just had the confidence, but instead I tried to have everything curated and perfect and polished and buttoned up. And that wasn't me. And I remember my sister being the first person that was like, I don't even recognize you when you're doing your thing. Like, that's not even you. And I was like, ouch. That's, and she's like, what you're saying is all good and helpful, but it's not really the Jenny that I know and that like your real family and friends know. And so my then coach at the time 
challenge me. She's like, try it for a week, right? Like, let's just try and experiment. Maybe you just show up real vulnerable, raw, unfiltered Jenny that we all know and love. And I was like, everyone's going to unfollow. Come on. And she's like, just try it. And so I did. And then I actually started to pull in the right people, right? Like I started to pull in people that were like, oh my gosh, finally, someone said it like it is. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I've been doing that the whole time, just behind the screen. I've never done it, you know, publicly. And so that was a major shift for me is just in podcasting and business in life in general. And like my kids know that I just mom is sometimes a hot mess, but like I get it done. It's not the prettiest direct, like direct route, but I get it done. Right. Yeah. And I love on your website, you say you're, you're, you know, you're a business coach, but you're also like the BFF vibe. And that's very much what I see from your messaging that you just bring to the table, especially like I loved on your in your messaging that you're like, I'm all about this. Like, here's what I am. Straight talk, strong drinks, short emails and, and helping you find your your superpower. And then you <laughs> you say, I'm not about comparison band-aid fixes, which I was like, hallelujah, oh, yeah. bullshit or the word moist. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that was even on there. <laughs> but I mean, you so, what I had to say it. <laughs> Can't do the M word, sorry. <laughs> Can't do it. So what does hustle mean to you? Because you've been incredibly successful as a business owner, but how did you redefine it for you? Yeah, I love this question. Uh, I am a workaholic by nature. I am a recovering perfectionist. I'm trying to loosen the reins on my type A-ness. And I think that was a big piece of it for me is that I really had to figure out, I had to figure out how I wanted to show up, how I wanted to be me, how I really wanted to, um, you know, how I wanted to not have to hustle all the time. And for the first 10 years of my business, that's all I did. I hustled, hustled. And I mean, I, like you said, I was a photographer for 20 years. I went to photography school. I got out of photography school. I was like, I'm starting a business right away. I was only 20 years old, started it in my hometown and quickly realized I didn't want to live in my hometown anymore. So I ended up meeting my now husband. We moved 2,000 miles away, not near a single soul that we knew. And I was like, starting over, let's go. But I knew to start a business in an entirely new area where I just left all of my clients. I had to hustle, right? And so I, we found ourselves and my husband was starting a startup at the time. And we um, we were working till midnight every night, you know, and waking up at seven o'clock the next morning. We didn't have kids. And so it was like, just go, 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 go. And I remember nearing burnout and I just looked at my husband. And I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. We had a five week old baby. We were on a plane because I had photogra- I'd taken on a wedding, a destination wedding. That's what I was doing at the time. So I was like, everybody packed their bags. I'm pumping in between ceremony and reception. I'm crying, baby's crying. My husband's like, what the hell are we doing here? It was horrible. And I remember him looking at me being like, is this really what you want to do? I was like, no, but I can't leave it. Like I've worked so hard to create this. I've hustled so hard to create this business that on paper is perfect and so many people are striving for this level of success and here I am hating what I've built right and I loved my client but I loved my newborn and my husband even more and I was like this is not gonna work I have to switch and so I think just him being like why are you doing this gave me permission to be like oh that's a good question and I for a long time I was the type of person that would force something I was like if I said I'm gonna do it I'm gonna do it I'm gonna finish it I'm gonna make it work and I would just keep working at it until I pretended it worked and I, I got to a point in my life maybe it's just with age where I was like I'd rather fail fast I'd rather fail forward I'd rather know when it's time to pivot and so um it was then and there that I was like I'm not gonna do this hustle culture anymore like if there is a smarter way to work and a smarter way to scale your business and at the end of the day I do not want to be like I miss my entire kid's childhood because I was hustling, right? Yeah, yeah. And I love that you brought up age a couple times now. And I know in our Instagram culture, like it seems very common to see young women in their 20s or like late 20s, suddenly they're they're at their million dollar level. And there's the comparison of like, oh, should I should I have been there yet? Yeah, like, yeah. Well, how do you think you would have been had you made a million dollars when you were in your 20s? Not good. <laughs> I couldn't even take care of myself in my 20s. Um, I mean, I had a business, but like I was sweaty. I was immature. I didn't know what the heck I was doing in real life. Um, but I, I was successful as a business owner uh, because I had that hustle. You know, like I just sat down and I did it. My family always says that we get shit done. Like that's just like my middle name is like get it done. And so I think that that... Um, you know, that was a big, a big thing for me where 
I had a coach once say to me, he, I, I said, I was like, I just wish that I had done this sooner. And he's like, everyone gets to where they're supposed to be, where they're meant to be eventually. You just took a different track, right? You just took a different path. And that path made you stronger and smarter and wiser. And now you can show up as unfiltered Jenny that we've all known and loved, right? If I had made a million dollars in my 20s, I would have thought it was because I was being that fake mm-hmm. Jenny, essentially, the buttoned up, curated, perfectly polished Jenny. And I really felt like I was living a double life for a long time. And I remember saying to my husband, I was like, we can't go out for drinks at this restaurant because what if my clients see me? And he's like, um, are you not allowed to have a glass of wine? It's not like you're underage. <laughs> I was like, I know, but like, that would be so like, unprofessional. And he's like, well, <laughs> we have senior clients at restaurants and they're also <laughs> drinking martinis. So does it really matter? And I was like, no, I guess not. But I just had a hard time understanding that. And I think that came with maturing and growing up and aging. Yeah. And when when you look at where you're headed now, what what's the vision? Mm-hmm. I love this question. So I am addicted to travel. Obsessed, obsessed, obsessed with travel. There's three things. I'm obsessed with helping women make money. Like that is my goal. Like I want to help as many women make as much money as possible so that they can live the life that they want with the people they love, right? Whatever that means for them. And so that's passion number one. Passion number two is travel. And if I'm not working, you can probably bet that I am on my computer, on my phone, like looking up the next spot to travel to or booking flights (laughs) and surprising people. I just did that last week. I was like, P.S. Mark, my husband, we're going to Cabo next week. And he's like, we what? So we're going to Cabo in like four days. And he's like, you just booked that? And I was like, I did because that's how I roll. And that's fun and it's spontaneous. And that's and we're able to do it now. And that makes a big difference, right? And then I'm also obsessed with real estate. And so we have a couple investment properties, Airbnbs, that sort of thing. We're building a custom house right now. Just renovated our current house. So I love that sort of stuff. But um, as far as the business goes, I, I want to incorporate that travel for my business. So I already host retreats around the country, but I want to take it on to a bigger level. Up until now, it's been just for my VIP one-on-one inner circle clients. um, And we are opening it up. So we're hosting four retreats next year. The first one's in Colorado for 20 women. And then the other three are going to be in Tulum, Mexico, Costa Rica. And we are considering Bali, which is super exciting. Um, And that's just going to be a smaller, more intimate group. So really combining the... um, the travel piece with the coaching aspects. So it would be for people that want to create passive income, that want to learn how to create courses, but do so while on a work vacation. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's that's a big piece of what's coming down the pipeline for my business. And then passive income myself with my online courses has been really fun. Just, you know, making sales in your sleep and knowing that you're helping make an impact in other people's lives and help them learn how to share their skills and knowledge with others. Brilliant. Brilliant. And when, when you travel, how... What percentage of the times are your, are your kids with you? Do, do, you, do your kids come with you on the retreats, but kind of stay in the back side? Like what what goes down? Good question. They do not come to the retreats. And the last time um, they found out that one of my top clients, uh, she's still nursing. And so the last three retreats, she's brought her family because she needs to nurse. And so they always rent a house like right next to the house that we host the retreat at or a hotel down the street. And uh, my, my kiddos found out and they're like, wait, what? people are bringing their kids and you're not bringing us? And I was like, no, 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 no. I mean, yes, but no. <laughs> that they don't come to the retreats because when I'm I'm there, I want to be on and I want to be fully focused on. I, that's one thing I've learned is that I don't want to half-ass anything anymore. I don't want to half-ass parenting. I don't want to half-ass wifing. I don't want to half-ass business owning and running. So when I'm at a retreat, I'm at a retreat and I'm fully focused on my clients. Um, but the kids travel a ton. Um, my son had traveled, I think he'd been on like 10 planes before he turned one or something. So we travel all over the world. We uh, were going to Hawaii in a couple months. We were in Hawaii a couple months ago. We've been to Costa Rica a few times. But I try to plan at least two trips a year, just my husband and I. And then um, usually around five or six. Well, around four to five retreats a year and then a bunch of business travel. I'm always meeting up with my team in different parts of the world to have that little so team retreat. Yeah. 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 I love I traveling with kids is a whole new paradigm. <laughs> like totally new paradigm. My son was born in Australia, actually. So Oh wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's been uh a, a, his first major plane ride was to to Perth to get him a passport. Um <laughs> Gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> that's incredible. I love that. Yeah. So it's 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 a it's being able to juggle all that. And I love that you said you don't want to half ass up anything anymore. So what did half assing look like for you? Because I think that that's it can look so different 
And I think when when our heads hit the pillow at night, we know when we have asked it, even if to the rest of the world, it looks incredibly productive and ridiculously on point. So yeah. what does it look like for you? Yeah, that's a good question. And I kind of dislike or I get mad at myself when people slide into my DMs and they're like, how do you do it? It all just looks so easy. And I'm like, oh. Well, girl, hold on. You got an hour? <laughs> Let me tell you how it really is. Um, because Instagram, it's like highlight reels. You know, it's not it's not real life. It's I mean, I try to keep it more real, but it's not it's the highlight reel. Right. And so half assing it for me, um, it finally was the last straw when my daughter, who's seven, was last year. She looked at me and was like, I- I've been getting better for sure of half assing everything. But the final straw for me was when she looked at me and she was like, Ma mom and I was like what I'm doing one of these you know with my phone and she's like put your phone down look at me she's seven and she was six at the time and she's like you you always aha me and you're not listening and I was like oh and I just like dropped her phone started crying I hugged her and I was like I'm so sorry you're 100 percent right I didn't notice you know when we become so like this thing's always in your right hand then it's a habit you have to break and so now we've started this whole new, I'm not a morning routine person, but I've started a morning routine with the kids where I don't pull my phone out at all, unless it's like an emergency, obviously, but I don't check emails. I don't do anything until after they're at school. I'm home. I've done my morning journal. And then, and that's a new thing for me too. And then I, and then I'll pull out my phone or my computer. And then, so now I sit with them and we have breakfast before school and we actually talk and it's amazing. And then I, I try really, really, really hard. It doesn't happen every day, but I do try to have all business done by the time school pickup happens because I do drop off and pick up. We don't have a nanny. So um, I just said that, that like that was bad or sad. Like we have had a nanny in the past. We just don't have a nanny right now. And and honestly, that was a big change for me too is I, I, I want to be there. I want to be the one dropping them off. I want to be the one picking them up. I want to be spending weekends together and not working. So now I don't work Friday, Saturday or Sunday. I, um, I will work at night once in a while after they're in bed if it's a project that I'm trying to finish up. But otherwise, I'm much more intentional and also date nights have been a big thing for my husband and I is just really scheduling that in and making sure that we take the time to do that uh, and and get that quality time in where we're not talking about business. We're not talking about work or kids or we're just talking because at the end of the day, you know, when the kids go off to college, I don't want to grow this way where we're apart and we don't really even know each other anymore. At the end of the day, I want to still have those things in common and still be the best friends that we are. Right. Yeah. I love the intentionality that you're bringing to each part of your day and to like the shifts in in each one area and yeah it's heart-wrenching my two-year-old goes like this to my phone mm-hmm. and I'm like okay all right buddy gotcha. like yeah. gotcha like what if I'm putting him down for a nap I'm like finishing up an email I'm like no oh, okay all right yeah they see everything they see and hear everything my, my 11 year old was mimicking me the other day I was on Voxer with a client just finishing up and he's like and he was like lipping what I was about to say and I was like I'm sorry did you just do my sales pitch and he's like I could do it in my sleep and I was like oh I don't know if that's good or bad. He's an entrepreneur at heart. But still, I was like, I think there's something good coming out of this. But you're right. If you can like recite what I'm about to say, then we have a problem. I should probably stop working around you guys so much. And yeah, like you're still providing that inspiration for like what is possible for them. Like you are showing them as an example yeah. how, to, how to do it all without doing it all. Yeah. And that's my goal. Honestly, that's my goal. Um, I love my mom to pieces, but she, um, she always worked at least three jobs. She was doing every, if it could be done herself, she would do it. She would mow the lawn. She would, she would, do, and she was a single mom, two girls. We were not easy kids <laughs> and she, she did it all. And it looked stressful because it was stressful. Right. And I remember saying, I don't want to do that. Like I, I want to be more intentional with my time and I want to, you know, be present with my kids when I can be. Yeah, I love that you mentioned that about your mom because I didn't see that anywhere in your origin story or anything, but it sh- it shows that dichotomy of what you've been able to create and build because of the example that you saw of what you didn't want. Yeah. And that that piece is so poignant for that transformation that, yeah. that you shared. How did you land on your origin story that like you share publicly and then like what pieces do you feel could you could bring in to bring even more sparkle and spice to it yeah absolutely um i don't talk a whole i do on my podcast but on my website i don't talk a whole lot about my past like we we grew up super duper poor um like food stamp store for it uh in the woods of vermont and single mom and she did an amazing job she raised two girls and she worked 
her ass off. And she really showed me what it was like to take the initiative and get something done. And I think that's why I was pretty bullheaded because I was like, oh, if I'm supposed to do it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to finish it. And it's going to be awesome. Damn it. <laughs> so I think that was a big piece that I learned from her is that she is really, really, really driven. If she puts her head to something, she will make it happen. And she definitely instilled that in my sister and I is that whatever you want in this life, you can go have you're going to work for it. Right. And I think that's a big piece of that hustle culture that came in for me too. I was like, and I've done a lot of like money mindset work in the past few years is that, you know, it doesn't have to be hard to be rewarding. Right. And I definitely grew up thinking that like, you have to struggle a bit. You have to hustle really, really hard. It has to be difficult in order to achieve X. Right. And that's been a big shift for me is that it doesn't have to be hard. This gets to be easy. You can work smarter, not harder. And that's a big thing that I'm trying to teach my children is that, you know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it unless it brings you joy, happiness, efficiency, more money, whatever that is. If it raises your vibrations, cool, go for it all day long. But if you don't want to go mow the damn lawn, hire the college kid or high school kid across the street for 25 bucks. Right. Like you don't have to do the thing just because you can. Yeah. Yeah. The the piece of your money mindset, because you said you do the work and I love diving into like, what does that mean? Like, because there's all the different variations of like doing the work, whether it's journaling or affirmations or just mm-hmm. like a daily practice of rethinking the thoughts that you're like, oh, it's, you know, that, that was a scarcity thought. So what did the work look like for you? I didn't even know that I had problems with <laughs> that part. Is that I definitely grew up being like, well, that must be nice. And money doesn't grow on trees, you know, like that sort of vibe. And so I went into college and into my early 20s, like pinching every single penny. And it wasn't until my husband and I, <laughs> funny story, my husband and I uh, met and we had only been dating for, I don't know, a couple months, maybe two months. And I wanted to travel the world and he had just gotten back from this big trip from Costa Rica. And he's like, I'll go with you. And I was, we had been working together and I was like, I don't really even know you, but sure. Sounds good. Cause I fly by the seat of my pants. And so I had never really traveled until that point. So I've never really traveled um, until my twenties and now I'm obsessed, but I told her, we told our parents and they're like, you're going where with whom for six months backpacking just the two of you in Central America. And so we backpacked and I was a crazy person. I was psychotic. I kept this journal and I was like, every single day we can't spend more than $11 each, which is funny that it was 11, now 11, 11 like 11 are my number. Yeah. And so um, every day we could only spend $11 each, which you can actually live off of in, at that time in Central America, which still you probably could. But I was crazy. I was like, oh my gosh, we're getting close to, t- you got to stop. You can't, we can't order that like apple juice at breakfast or whatever it was. And he's like, calm down. There's more where that came from. And I had never heard that expression. I was like, more like where, like on a tree? Did it grow on a tree? Like I didn't get it. And so I came home being like the most we bickered on that trip. And now we're married 20 years later, but like uh, it was always around money. And so I was like, something's off here. Like you grew up like having this really great feeling. Like you enjoy money. Money's good and positive. I grew up thinking money was bad and evil. Right. And so, and not anything against my parents. It's just like the environment you're raised in. Right. And so I definitely realized then, but I didn't do the work until more recently. It was, it's been within the last five years, which is also when my business has scaled. And so by doing the work, I hired a mindset coach who is a friend of one of my coaches. And she was like, just do an experimental call with her. See what you, and I was like, I am not into the woo. I'm not doing it. Uh Uh-uh, nope. Like what? She's going to have me sit cross-legged and be like, hi, I'm rich. (laughs) And that's what I was envisioning, right? Yeah. So I um I hired Dustin and she is absolutely incredible and she's a fast talker East Coaster like myself and she was straight to the point no fluff like oh why why do you think that way and like really helped me come to my own decisions of I don't want to live with that those thoughts anymore and the the things I believed about money were 100% lack scarcity mindset right and and that doesn't have to be that way and so I think one of the most valuable things I took out of and I still coach with her and she's on my team now but is that I had these like massive um, highways paved in my head for the ways that I believed about money, right? And the, the the feelings I had around people that had it, right? And so she slowly but surely taught me that I have to create, like when you're walking through the woods, the first time you walk through the woods, it's going to be like a very hard, you're, there's no path, right? But if you walk that path every single day for over a year, then now there's going to be a path. And so she like breaking it down into toddler proof like that for me helps because I was like, okay, this is a hard thing for me to think and believe because I've never believed this, but I'm creating new little paths, which will then become dirt roads, which will then become a little tiny road into a highway, into a five lane highway. And we can shut the other highways down because I don't even believe that shit anymore. Right. And 
that that has been a big piece of it is just catching myself in those moments where I'm like, ah, oh, I can't afford that or that must be nice. And I'm like, whoop, 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 sorry. <laughs> I even caught my 11 year old saying it to my seven year old the other day. He's like, well, that's a scarcity mindset, Willa. And I was like, stop the car. I've done my job. <laughs> I'm sorry. What did you just say? But I think it's so important because if we were taught this stuff in schools, my gosh, I think we'd all be so much healthier. I I completely agree. I completely agree. But like not only the mindset piece, but also the management piece. Of mm-hmm. what it takes to to manage and grow well. Yeah, if we were taught that in schools. I think everyone would feel a lot more empowered. Um, totally. Yeah, with- absolutely. Could not agree more. Yeah, yeah. So looking at your so your mindset shifted, which really you you said attributed to the massive scalability and growth. Yeah. How has your messaging changed or evolved since you started? Without even thinking about it, I'm including those things, right? Like I talk about it more. I'm not afraid to talk about it with um, random strangers because I, I just, I don't know. And and maybe they find it annoying. They probably do. But I'm like, hang on, can I challenge that thought? I was getting my hair done yesterday and the front desk girl was talking about uh, how she wants to take this trip to Europe. And I was like, what's stopping you? And she like looked at me like I had 10 heads. And I was like, no, seriously, what's stopping you? She's like, well, it's expensive. And she's like, I have to save up. And I was like, what are you doing differently to save up? And she was like, I'm sorry, who are you? <laughs> but like, it just feels like, I don't know. I, I just want to share this with other people and be like, just book the flight. You're not going to actually save the money. You're not like, or maybe you will, but it's kind of unlikely. So just book the flight. Find a way to book the flight. Because if you want it, you'll find a way to afford it. Right. And so instead of being like, I can't afford that, like Russell Brunson just said this in a uh, post, I think yesterday, he was like, find a way to afford it. Like you start thinking, how can I afford it instead of I can't afford it, right? And so I've just, in my messaging, I think I've just naturally started sprinkling that in because that's truly how I feel. I almost feel like I lost all these years thinking that way. And now that I think this way, I just feel like so much more open-minded and just like, I just feel healthier and stronger and more empowered. And I want to pass that on to not only my own children and show them what's possible, so that they don't grow up having them must be nice mindset. Um, and also to other random people, like the girl at the, nail, at the hair salon, be like, you can do it. Book the flight to Europe right now. <laughs> yeah. And and just what that what that will create when yeah. you just make the decision. Like when I did my TED talk, it was about like, oh, it's like the people really are just like crappy at just making a decision. We yeah. have the would likes and the want tos, but really when when we come down to it, it's do or do not. There is no try. Yeah. But like <laughs> totally. And that's a choice that you're making. If you're choosing not to make a decision, that's a choice. Right. And then they sit there and they're like, I don't know, I'm just so indecisive. I'll figure it out when I figure it out. And I'm like, that's not how this works. But okay. <laughs> I'll be here when you're ready. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's I think also that that's been more sprinkled into my messaging too. This like big sister bestie vibes is how I try to look at it. Like obviously I'm going to respect other people's opinions and if they're not mine, that's totally cool. And I love hearing other people's perspectives, but I, I definitely challenge my clients, especially my inner circle one-on-one clients. Cause I know them so well. And we travel together on these retreats. I really challenge them when I catch them in a thought where I'm like, mm, big sister Jenny is about to slide in and give me some tough love. Is that really, really how you feel? Is that really what you believe? Can I challenge that thought? Because I think that that's really important. It's, and again, like I want to attract and repel, right? I, I, I'm going to be me unapologetically on my podcast, on social media, on my website. And if you don't like it, that's okay. I'm not for everyone. I don't want to be for everyone. I'm fully okay with not being for everyone. 20 years ago, I was not. I was trying to please everybody. I was trying to be everyone's best friend and business bestie. And I don't have the bandwidth for that. And I'm also not for everyone. And that's okay. Who did you really discover that you were not for? Like, what are the characteristics or qualities of people that you're like, yeah, I realize that person's just not for me. Yeah. So being um, type A, recovering perfectionist and bullheaded, <laughs> I think that's the Irish side of my family. Uh, I I would try to help everybody. And I, I can even look back on like my friendships in elementary school, middle school, my boyfriend, my poor boyfriend in high school, and just tried to make him someone that he was never going to be. And so I think I always tried to fix everyone's problems. I tried to like change people. And I think that that's really been a thing for me is like, you cannot change people. People have to want that change. And not everyone's willing to receive that change or that message or, you know, whatever you're about to sell them that they probably don't want to hear. And so I think that was a big shift for me as I finally stopped saying, I'm not going to say yes to everybody. Like, just because you're willing to pay me does not mean 
that I should let you hire me, right? And it has to be a two-way street. I have to feel like you are the right client for me that I truly believe I can help, that I feel confident that I can help and that I'm the right coach for you and vice versa. You have to feel that about me. And so I always put it through that little filter. And when people are like, oh yeah, I'm gonna keep looking around. I'm like, that's awesome. So glad you just realized that because that just saved us both a lot of time and energy and frustration probably, right? And so I don't really call it like red flag clients. It's more, I, I want to empower people. I don't want to create codependent relationships. Mm-hmm. I want to I want to lead by example and I want to show you that it's okay to try, right? Like I'm going to teach you how I did it. Not every single thing I did is going to work for you. And, you know, you might find something that works even better that I might start trying. You know, you never know. And so I, I think that was a big shift for me too is that... um Jenna, like I mentioned earlier, Jenna Couture was my first big business coach. And when I left her mastermind, I I can look back now and look at my branding and my messaging. I was trying to be Jenna. I was straight up trying to be Jenna. And I I love her and respect her and admire her. And I I remember her saying to me once, she was like, just be you. Stop trying to be me. Be you. And I was like, I don't know how to be me because I had never really shown myself. And so I think that was a big pivotal moment for me too. And so I think it's just, yeah. Trying to figure out, you know, within the first few minutes of meeting somebody online through a DM or an application, like, am I the right coach for you? Do I feel confident I can help you? And that is why I voice DM a lot, because I think you can just get to the point so much faster. (laughs) Be like, oh, yeah, we're a good fit. We're besties. Let's go. Let's roll. Let's do this. Or "Mm, I think that you might be better off with this coach or that coach or keep looking, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's being able to have that that awareness, that situational awareness. And so what was the experience when as, as a recovering people pleaser? That first one, that first client that you're like, ooh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be really courageous and say no to. Yeah. It not was a, hard. Not a fit. It was really hard. And all those scarcity mindset things kept starting to sneak back in, being like, oh, what if you can't pay the bills? And you just passed up a seven thousand dollar client, you idiot. You know, and I was like, <laughs> like I started to spiral and I was like, yeah, it's okay. And literally that very next day, I got an inquiry from the perfect client and they signed right away. No questions asked. And I was like, amazing. And then I worked with them for several years after that. And I was like, oh, thank goodness. And it just shows that like the universe or whatever you believe in is there. They've got your back. And if you saying no is a good thing, saying no is a complete sentence and that is okay. That was something I really had to work hard on is saying no, because I was like, yes, of course I'll go do that. I remember my husband being like, do you really want to go do that? And I was like, hell no, I don't want to do that. Why'd you say yes? I was like, because I have to. And he's like, you do not have to say no. And so, yeah, I think just saying no is okay because it opens the door to so many other op- opportunities, right? Yeah, that that no is so powerful. And the scarcity voice that can happen, especially with that first one where you're like, oh my gosh, here's here's all the reasons. But it just is a testament to it's always this or something better. And yeah. you're always going to get what you tolerate. Yes. Oh, preach. <laughs> and so if you like just having had that similar experiences where I'm like, you're not a fit. Yeah. And that that declaration of like, I'm only available mm-hmm. for clients who are my ideal client game changer for absolutely bringing in the right people into your world 100 percent. yep so when we look at your like going on podcasts because i just want to like a i know that in the beginning you said that you are what i lovingly call like a, you're a data nerd and so i call them freak in the sheets i've <laughs> 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 never heard that i'm totally stealing it Breaking the spreadsheets. Um, And so what are the data points that you really study, measure, obsess over when in regards to podcasting? Mm, Good question. When it comes to podcasting, I'm not very good at that, to be honest. Um, My podcast manager always sends me the data and I'm like, okay, cool. Can we do better? How can we move the needle? How can we help more? And so we're going to be doing a new, because I am really good with ads, um, we're going to do a new ad strategy and promote the podcast that way, which I've never done. I've only used ads to, you know, for freebies or um, passive income courses and whatnot, Uh, but I've never done awareness ads around the podcast. So that came up this week, actually, I bet you asked, like, oh, I obsess over everything else numbers wise in my business. Um, Well, I back up. I used to obsess over the income, the revenue. And so I would refresh it every single day, every single day. And I started to notice that my bank account started to go down, down, down. And then of course I started to spiral. And I talked to my coach about this and I was like, why, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this all of a sudden? She's like, because you're focused, like what you focus on, your energy goes towards and that's, you're just going to manifest more of that, right? So if you're getting a bunch of clients that aren't the right fit, 
or you're looking at your bank account, it's going down. You're just going to make it go down even more because you're obsessing over it. You're white knuckling it. And she gave a great example. She was like, the CEO of Nordstrom is not out there stocking the shelves, running the cash register, folding the sweaters, ordering new items. That's not what they're doing, right? They're not refreshing their bank account every 24 minutes, 24 seconds in my case at that point. And so I stopped looking at that. I don't look at the bank account numbers as often. I do still, and I take a screenshot because it makes me happy. And I'm like, look how far I've come, right? Like that makes me really, really happy. But I don't obsess over revenue numbers. I do obsess over ads. So I, I'm constantly looking at ads. I have a whole spreadsheet that I've created um, for my clients to be able to figure out what your ROAS is, your return on ad spend, and really understanding what those metrics mean because people are so scared of ads because they've either boosted a post and it didn't work or they turned on an ad and they quote unquote lost a bunch of money to Zuckerberg or whatever they think. And I want to teach people how to use ads in an effective way that actually bring results to you and impact to others and also how to read those results. So answer your question about podcasts. We don't actually analyze the data as well as we should, but we will be starting next week. <laughs> I'm I'm really interested as to how you see uh, Facebook ads and Instagram ads being leverageable for podcasts, because I've heard various strategies in, in regards to that, more or less limiting beliefs, because I think like anything is just a belief. Yeah. Um, so seeing how like an ads queen like you, who's so data driven when it comes to ads performance, shows up with the podcast performing well on ads. Um, yeah. Other podcast ad strategies like leveraging Spotify ads or um, joint venture, like cross promotional sponsorships right. with other podcasters. Um, yeah. So I, I'm very curious as to how how it does. Yeah, I'll keep you posted. I'm thinking an awareness ad and um, a traffic ad, which would be good because that'll obviously drive traffic. Um, but the more like awareness ads convert for under a penny. So it's like, why not throw, you know, 100 bucks out in a day or whatever and see what happens. But I'm really excited to track that for 30 days because that'll give real data points. Obviously, it takes some time to pick up, but I'm yeah. really pumped about that. And I think that that's such a huge point of that it takes some time to pick up, especially mm -hmm. with ads. Like so often we get so used to in this immediate culture of like, I want a salad, press a button, Uber Eats, here it goes. Yeah. Like in this immediacy of results where really you need to track something over a time period, a time frame. And seven days is not enough of time to really no. be able to see leverageable, measurable results. Yeah, I think that's the most frustrating part when I'm, for my clients or for anyone running ads is that if you don't know what you're doing, you don't know what you're doing, right? And so you see money going out the window every day and you haven't seen results yet. And so you're like, I have to turn this off. But it's only been three days, which actually hurts your ad because now the algorithm didn't even get to figure out who the people were that were engaging with it or what type of people want your offer, what graphics convert for you, what copy and messaging converts. It only had a day or two days or three days and you freaked out and hit the stop button. And so that actually is not good for ads. You want to leave them on for at least 14 days, if not longer, before we touch anything. Yeah. And that's consistent with any sort of marketing or advertising strategy, podcast guesting included. Like when we first started doing our podcast guesting strategy for getting me booked on podcasts, because I use it selfishly just for myself, um, <laughs> before we started our agency, um, like uh, it took time. It took it took some patience and tweaking and looking at like, okay, well, what what types of podcasts were really actually leveraging like profit and new leads? Like, and, and also since, you know, with podcasts, sometimes it's you record it and then it doesn't come out until two months right. later, three months later. And then so it, there, there is a, it's a longer term strategy that yeah. adds, you can at least get immediate performance to see how it does. But when we started looking at like what other points of data can we can we embed in to podcast guesting to see how at least that can sort of give us a trajectory so yeah we started doing with just like immediately after our podcast we do two-way street like uber like airbnb reviews like how the podcast do how the guests do was any like further business discussed any like how can we build on that relationship so sure. just allowing both parties to be able to cultivate that relationship rather than it being just like, okay, we have to wait 60 days until the podcast comes out to get any sort of data on like how it can book. Yeah. No, that's super smart. I should definitely do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, team, when you listen to this podcast, can we do that? <laughs> yeah, track it. Because when you see like the power of how it 
how it evolves and how, what the podcaster says. And I mean, that's how I've been able to do over 200,000 in just new business revenue from just guest podcasting alone. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So that's, uh, and it came from being able to look at feedback. And I think it is one of those limiting beliefs around guest podcasting that like, oh, well, the podcast didn't distribute yet. I'm like, doesn't mean business can't go down before then. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Unless so what has been your guesting strategy for when you guest on podcasts like this one? (laughs) I don't have one. <laughs> I do not have one. If people come and ask and I feel like it's a good fit and we do it. Um, I did, when I was a photographer, I got asked to be on a, a bunch of podcasts, um, you know, around album making and uh, labs and whatnot, um, which was great and super fun. Um, but just like most everything else in life, I never really go in with a strategy. I just wing it and riff. Um, but no, we don't have one. And I, I think it's really fun. I Every time I'm on a podcast as a guest, I'm Oh, I'm, I always leave like so much more higher vibrations being like, that was so fun. I love that. And I and um, I hear the same from people when they guest on mine, which is great. And I love that feeling. I don't want it to be like a burden for anyone or, you know, like, oh, I got to go do this thing and it's going to take 30 minutes or whatever. I want it to be fun and, you know, and beneficial to the listeners, too. Like, that's a big piece of it for me. I want to make sure it's a good fit for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing that I've seen with top 100 podcasters is the value that they place on their audience. And yeah. I'm really making sure that their audience is well served by the either the solo content or the interview and making sure that there's that that win 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 scenario for everyone involved. Yeah, absolutely. So, Jenny, I have loved our conversation so much. What, what did you love about our conversation? I always love to ask. I just love how real it was, how easy it was. Like I always I, I just enjoy meeting people through the internet, which is amazing to me still. <laughs> I'm like, I love that you can make friends through the internet. Um, but I love just getting on and just vibing with someone immediately being like, oh, this is going to be a great episode, right? Like, I just, I love how real you are. I love you. You're very good at asking questions. Like, I love the questions that you ask me and that you can tell that you are thinking about your your listeners, you know, and what value we can bring to them together. So I just, I really loved it. Awesome. And I always love to ask, Jenny, what would you stand on your soapbox about? And like, this is your moment claim the stage, throw down the mic. What would you preach on for hours? Mm -hmm. And I do preach on this for hours and it drives my family crazy when we're on holidays together. (laughs) But I honestly believe that every single one of us has an online course living in their head. And I I think that my 11-year-old's made an online course. Like I don't think that it matters how old you are or how experienced you are. I think that every single person that's lived and can talk and can type (laughs) has a course in their head, right? And I I was chatting with a mom this morning who has a son who's autistic and she's been doing some holistic practices with him at home and she's seeing results. And now other moms are asking her for advice. And she's like, is this something I could turn into a course? I was like, yes, do not pass. Go, 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 go. Like, yes. And I, and my brother's a contractor and he's young and he's booking like multi-million dollar houses. And he's like, I don't know, could I create a course? I was like, uh, yeah, how to get your first paid multi-million dollar home as a contractor who's under the age of 30. Yes, yes, go. And so I just, I think that every single one of us is oftentimes we're, we're too close to our own genius, right? And we're like, uh, who really wants to hear from us? Who am I to teach? There's already courses out there on this. I don't need to go create another. And that's not true. I really believe that each of us has something to share. If you have skills or knowledge or experience that can bring someone more joy, more money, more efficiency, you know, whatever that is, bring bring raise their vibrations, whatever, like you have a sellable course and you can make an impact while making income. And I, that's what I would preach about for hours. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I don't know why your family would get tired of hearing about that. <laughs> <laughs> Only one of them has actually created a chorus. And the rest are like, yeah, I'll get to it. I'm like, what's stopping you now? Let me let the computer. And they're like, it's Thanksgiving. And I'm like, I know. We're going to map out your whole course real quick. <laughs> that's that's my secret sauce is that it gets shit done. And they're like, yeah. can, can we just make the turkey and the mashed potatoes? I'm like, right after we do this. <laughs> Right after we create a course, and then you get to hear that lovely ding of the passive income bell, like Boeing. Yeah. And they probably get annoyed by that too. I'm like, you don't want this? And I'll scroll through like the daily sales on my phone, and they're like, are you bragging? I'm like, no, I'm trying to inspire you. This is possible. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's that's my soapbox moment. <laughs> oh, Jenny, I, I, I think everyone should climb on that soapbox with you, like, and yes. just build it. Right. 
I mean, you never know until you try. And I think oftentimes you're going to be surprised by how many people actually want what you have that will benefit from what you can teach them. Because we, we just sit there and we're like, ah, and doesn't everybody know this? And I said the same thing. I said the same thing to my first coach. I was like, everyone already knows how to do that. And she's like, ah, no, you just think everyone does because it's been so long since you were at that point. You've come so far. Now, isn't it kind of rude to dive with all that information in your head? And I was like, oh, ouch. Yeah, it kind of is. She's like, don't you want to share that with others to help them move the needle in their life or their business? And I was like, absolutely, I do. I let people pick my brain all the time. She's like, that's a course. <laughs> Turn it into a course. <laughs> they can still pick your brain, but they have to pick for that information. And I was like, oh, right. <laughs> that's, oh, yeah, the pick your brainers and being able to get extract the course from all the things that everyone wants to pick your brain about anyway. Totally. And I do. And honestly, like I, I spend a lot of time in the DMs, voice DMing people. And I don't care if you join my program or not. I hope you do because I, I think you'll have faster results because I'm handing you the proven blueprint step by step. But if you want to just pick my brain and like validate your offer, cool. Shoot me a DM and I will be honest with you. <laughs> As you can tell, I'm pretty straightforward. And so I think that's a big piece of it is that, you know, you, people with all these ideas, but then they don't follow through. They're the ones that need a course that's going to teach them how to create the course, right? Like you've got all these ideas. Now let's go actually make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful, Jenny. Oh, Thank you so I much. have absolutely loved this conversation. Jenny, where can we find you? How can we work with you? I know you have your seven figure coach podcast, which I highly recommend because it's got some spicy content. <laughs> it does have some spicy content. Maybe don't listen into it on the speaker with kids in the car. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, my podcast, um, you can, all of my offers are on my website, jennymaroney.com. And then I hang out, like I said, on Instagram. That's where I live. So it's Instagram uh, forward slash Jenny Maroney. Amazing. And though all of those links will be in the description, as always, Communication Queens, let your voice be heard. It's time that you stand out.